Hi, and very good morning to all of you. Uh, first and foremost, let me warmly welcome all of you for yet another CPD webinar program organized by Sri Knowledge Academy. Uh, today's topic of uh, discussion would be making sense of syncopy, which would be delivered by a reputed consultant and a distinguished person, Dr. Kirti Bandara Dimudava, consultant cardiac electrophysiologist, National Hospital Candy. So before we move into our routine lecture, uh, let me humbly remind you all of you regarding our housekeeping rules, uh, rules as usual. The we'll webinar link will be available until 9.42 a.m. For anyone I mean, to join, I mean, join I mean, I mean, no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the CT certificate for CPD points and the CPD certificate. Uh -huh. As you all know, this is to improve and maintain the standards of the CPD program conducted by Shri. Uh, so thank you all for your strict adherence to the CPD regulations and for your kind compliance. Yeah. I also would like to humbly uh, remind all of you to keep yourself on mute and turn off the video throughout the webinar to avoid unnecessary disturbances. For any questions and queries, please drop it in the chat functions. Also change the chat settings to our panelists and attendees so that they can be seen and discussed towards the end of the webinar. So without further delay, uh, let's move into our lecture on syncopy by Dr. Kirti Bandara Diulaga, consultant cardiac electrophysiologist, National Hospital, Candy. Uh, over to you, dear sir. Good morning uh, to you all. Uh, thank you for joining uh, uh, today's uh, CPD. Uh, I shall must thank uh, three initiative for uh, uh, providing the platform for uh, uh, all those, uh, the medical officers and uh, our trainees uh, to enhance their knowledge by uh, joining uh, and inviting uh, you know uh, speakers in uh, specialists or experts in their particular areas to deliver talks uh, today uh, we will be uh, discussing about uh, uh, syncopy which is an important topic and uh, in your day-to-day -day practice i presume uh, uh, our colleagues from various uh, uh, specialties uh, must have participated this event and uh, may it be general medicine, anesthesia, pediatrics, uh, or even surgical colleagues. This is something you would encounter in your uh, everyday uh, practice. And uh, so I presume uh, that this lecture will uh, give you uh, some overlook uh, to uh, uh, manage your patients and refer them appropriately. <clears throat> okay, so the, today's uh, topic is going to be about uh, 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 syncopy. So before I start with the, the discussion, uh, let me uh, rephrase some of the important concepts that, uh, that, are, that has a direct relationship with what I'm going to talk about. So as we know that we all die one day, so death is not the enemy. The American physician George Ludberg uh, thinks that human death is normal, which we all agree. We all die. The real enemies are actually not the death. It's apparently the premature death, disability, pain, human suffering, and prolongation of dying. So he thinks that all the rest is mostly noise. So this is an important concept that we all have to understand when we treat our patients. The World Health Organization defines that when if someone to uh, die before age of seven, reaching 70, that is a premature death. So you might wonder why I talk uh, about death in a syncope lecture. So most of the time, uh, if you take one in five deaths that happen prematurely are due to sudden cardiac death. This is a very important uh, health issue that we all encounter. If you go back to our families, you might find out that's not a strange thing that you... Uh, uh, to find out that someone in your family, maybe in your extended family, or someone who's known to you among your friends have died suddenly without an explainable reasons. So when a person die a natural death due to a cardiac cost, and that is being heralded by the abrupt loss of consciousness, this is where a syncope come into play. So uh, syncope is an important symptom that precedes a natural sudden cardiac death. So recognizing syncope and appropriately tre treating them and re appropriately referring these patients to specialist attention, you might 
be able to prevent a tragic death. Uh, so bef- to make it more interesting, I will bring some cases that I have come across during my practice. So the case one is about a male uh, who is in his uh, 20s has been experiencing, so just carefully pay, pay attention to all the wordings that are that I put in here. A male in his 20s present with recurrent and brief disease spells. Remember in Sri Lankan context, people uh, uses various terms. There is a significant regional language variation, dialect variation when it's come to what they actually feel. So you have to understand, get yourself familiarized with the terminology that people use and exactly ask what they want to describe. So this gentleman came to it brief disease spells in all postures. That means he experienced his symptoms when he was lying flat, when he was up and above in his feet, or even when he was seated. Uh, I hope it can you can see. Uh, so this is about a patient who is in his 20 years of age who presented to us with uh, brief disease spells. And uh, so he experienced these symptoms in all postures. And uh, these symptoms had been disturbing his sleep as well. So he experienced, he wake up uh, from his sleep with chest tightness and experiencing nocturnal sweats. And these are, you know, paroxysmals, they, it, they come and goes. And he denies having a significant uh, past medical history. There's no family history of, you know, like premature death or sudden cardiac death or unexplained death. Uh, he had done several ECGs at various occasions. And uh, since he was having sim- these symptoms for a brief period, the, other than sinus tachycardia on the ECG, the spot ECG did not pick up anything. So he had been uh, reassured many times uh, that his uh, 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 ECGs ha- had been okay. So then I decided to do a halter test. Halter means 20, it's an ambulatory ECG. It can be up to 24 hours or beyond that as well. So this is what his ECG halter shows. We will get back to these uh, uh, the ECGs at the end of our presentation. So just remember, this is what his ECG was. This is a snapshot of his halt. And he was symptomatic during this this capture. So second, about a a colleague of ours had been a house officer, Gina Knox. He had a, a drop attack while he was working at the labor room. So he recovered from it and his ECG was taken. The ECG was normal except having some few premature ventricular complexes. He was then observed in an ICU with the whole hook. He also did not have a significant past medical history. And his family history has also been uh, not very significant. So this was the thing it recorded on his halter. So we will get back to this as well. So the third case that I'm going to show to you is about a 13 year old girl. uh, Who uh, had been experiencing uh, recurrent uh, black trout and brief unresponsiveness and rigidity at classroom and ground. So she had received, uh, done uh, several ECGs, then an echo or a halter and an EEG. And so far, nothing was were able to uh, explain her symptoms. So then I decide, we decided to do a tilt table test. Tilt table test is, I will get back to in a moment. We'll discuss this, uh, about the tilt table test. So this is what, what we have found out on the tilt table test. And it was a 
it is a test that we normally done for people who suspected to have syncope, especially in upright position. We put the patient on a table which is capable bed which is capable of you know, tilting upward and and can we were, we can monitor the blood pressure, heart rate, and ECG continuously and see exactly what happened. This is something we do for patients who come with syncope and uh, it help out to uh, sometime you know understand their symptoms. So the ECG was taken at the time as well. Uh, uh, and then the, uh, I will we will get back to the CCG uh, once we conclude our presentation. So this uh, the fourth case is about a fee, eight year old female who came to us with recurrent drop attacks during dining. So these symptoms characteristically happens when she was having her meals, and she had suffered several soft tissue injury as a result of the fault. So she was only on treatment for hypertension and the multiple ECG was taken. That has been okay. And an echocardiogram was also done, which is also uh, normal. Then uh, we did a 24-hour uh, e holder. That's an ambulatory ECG. And this is what we have found out on her ECG. And if you can, I'm not sure if you can see it, uh, the timestamp is 20 past 40, that means in the afternoon. And this was, uh, she developed symptoms while the halter was hooked to her while she, when she was having her dinner. And this was able to, uh, was very uh, helpful to us to de uh, determine her diagnosis. So uh, coming back to the uh, proper presentation, so hopefully now you might remember these patients, I have given you several scenarios. Uh, these things happen at various circumstances and sometimes these things can be quite a mystery. It makes a lot of time and effort to understand what is going with their patients. So uh, today's presentation, I will try to define what is meant by syncope and and give you detail uh, outlook about as to how we should set about our patients in terms of assessment and 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 uh, doing the risk stratification. Then we will discuss common causes and their treatments as well. So there are two terms that one has to understand. One thing is called transient loss of consciousness. In simple term, TLOC. T-lock means transient loss of consciousness and then syncope. So transient loss of consciousness has a broad meaning. So it's a situation where patients experience real or apparent loss of consciousness with loss of awareness. So for that particular period, patients are normally amnesic. That amnesia could extend anti-grade or retrograde fashion as well. Normally, when a patient is unconscious, the, that person will have abnormal motor control. It could be either flaccid or rigid. Then the patient will be unresponsive for the period. And normally, as the name indicates, the patient should have symptoms for a brief period and patient should recover. So transient loss of consciousness happen for practical purposes in two circumstances. One thing is traumatic t lock other thing is non-traumatic t lock So remember, a patient who has an apparent medical condition might end up having head trauma as a result of the fall. So it is even important for our surgical colleagues to remember this fact, a patient who apparently come with an SH or STH or intracranial hemorrhages might have actually had a medical reason behind it. So this is something uh, 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 people have to remember. So broadly, non-traumatic transient loss of consciousness can be due to either syncope or epileptic seizure. Patient can rarely have psychogenic transient loss of consciousness as well. There can be several other conditions where patient might present it with impaired conscious level due to a different reason that are, does not normally uh, fall into either syncope or epilepsy. 
something like you know subclavian steel syndrome vestibular bacillus pia subarachnoid hemorrhages in the patient may experience concussions and even cyanotic breath holding spells in children so it is important to keep an open mind and remember these things when you encounter patient who present with uh, transient loss of consciousness so what becomes a syncope then syncope is a is a technical term uh, or a, it has a technical uh, explanation when a person experiences a t lock or the transient loss of consciousness due to cerebral hyperperfusion that is is called syncope so sometimes it might can be quite difficult for us to prove that patient has experienced t lock due to cerebral hyperperfusion so it is always important to keep an open mind and remember this thing so by definition syncope is where when a t lock happens with a rapid onset and lasting for short duration and recover spontaneously this is an important distinct between cardiac arrest if any any surge, uh, anesthetic colleagues has joined this you may have seen uh, during anesthesia you know, in a in a icu setup patient might develop a systole and, and normally without uh, uh, waiting we tend to intervene and so there can be a situation where the patient develop sink up or a systole due to a transient reasons like you know vagal activation maybe instrumentation intubation but uh, this is different to cardiac arrest cardiac arrest is where the patient might develop a systole or, or any other kind of arrhythmia and the patient does not recover until you intervene whereas in syncope oh, uh, still patient can develop a systole which normally improves spontaneously without intervention only thing is we might not wait until patient recover on its own so we tend to jump in and intervene so sometimes those who had simple syncope witness syncope they might be labeled as cardiac arrest and and we get lot of referrals from our anesthesia colleague you know a systole following you know uh, intubation a systole following you know instrumentation and one of the important situation one has to remember putting a patient under general anesthesia does not prevent patient developing pain induced vasovagal so uh, it is very important that is why it is highly advised that even if a, if you put a patient under general anesthesia if you are to do a you know cut open the patient do an instrumentation you have to give them lo uh, appropriate amount of locus anesthesia even last week i got a patient who was intubated and develop asystole during a se section only to find out that the, the operator did not given enough local anesthetics to the patient so giving putting giving or general anesthesia or spinal anesthesia does not uh, give you a, a, you know a freedom to not to use local anesthetics because the vagal activation happens at the subcortical level and generally does not have you know any effect by the anesthesia so it's an important thing to uh, remember when you perform the, uh, anesthesia for your patients so what cause of syncope if a heart stop for more than 6 seconds in a supine position that will give rise to loss of consciousness so this is an important thing that you remember on an ecg if you see um, you know two and two second three second pauses may it, it may not be actually causing the syncope to the patient heart has to stop at least for 6 to 8 seconds because the brain can maintain the consciousness briefly because of the, the uh, atp that are available to use so for a patient to uh, lose the consciousness Uh, it will at least takes 6 to 8 second uh, stopping of the heart uh, uh, to you know knock you off at the same time if the blood pressure drops one below a critical point so normally if it is uh, 50 to 60 at heart level or 35 30 to 45 at brain level in upright position uh, can give rise to you know loss of consciousness 
So we know that from our physiological days, that systolic blood pressure is a product of cardiac output and a total peripheral resistance. If either drops in uh, alone or in combination, should give rise to syncope. So we know that cardiac output drops due to tachyarrhythmias or primary bradyarrhythmias. There's another thing called reflex syncope, a reflex bradycardia, that is uh, uh, the heart rate drops as a result from the influence from the brain, that is a vagal activation, and obstructive structural cardiac conditions like aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, and pulmonary embolism, and a, if a patient has a significant volume drop due to dehydration, diarrhea, or blood loss. Causes lead to uh, these causes lead to drop in cardiac output can precipitate a syncope. Total peripheral resistance drop that is the va we, uh, vasodilatation. It can be due to you know uh, one of the ex best example is a vasovagal activation. It leads to you know sudden dilatation of the vas vasculature, causing uh, uh, in uh, you know uh, apa or uh, uh, not absolute. Uh, subject to hypovolemia and even anaphylaxis, the same thing will happen. And certain condition where autonomic nervous system is impaired, uh, some primary brain condition pathologies, or even patients who had diabetes, advanced diabetes, CKDs, uh, can have the same thing. And, and certain hormonal deficiencies like absence of cortisol, and uh, these conditions, or so some patients who are on you know, antihypertensive medication, uh, like uh, you know, calcium channel blockers, uh, presosine, this kind of medication causes vasodilatation uh, or even uh, nitrates. These conditions can cause a uh, drop in total peripheral resistance, causing blood pressure to drop and cardiac output to drop, and patient will develop syncope. So it is important to understand that in many occasions, syncope is heralded by more than one mechanism. So why do we need to talk about it? I you know one of the important pleasure, if you understand, if you are like, you know, uh, uh, philosophical about yourself as to what happened uh, around you, you might understand one of the, you know, supreme bliss or pleasure is that you have the feeling that you were, are in control and you can control yourself. You can, you are, you have the ability to control the people around you, the environment around you that gives you the confidence that the self-actualization. Uh, so as a human, that is one of the, the highest accomplishment a person can achieve. And, and syncope is completely opposite where you lose your ability to control yourself briefly. So this can be quite dramatic experience for a person who experienced syncope. And not all that, the syncope can be lethal as well. The optimal evolution, evaluation remain controversial and the treatment, uh, the evolution is quite expensive. And uh, uh, thanks to our neurological colleagues, uh, the, uh, the awareness about epilepsy is great as compared to syncope. So people sometimes, even if it is a, so dramatic in nature, people tend to ignore when you have syncope or calanthe. And not all patients with syncope uh, doesn't come to the emergency services as well. And unfortunately, the, the worst part of the tragic part of it is some people can die suddenly uh, be, even before reaching the hospital. So in Western countries, if you take uh, deaths happen between age of, ages of 20 to 80, one in five is due to cardiac arrest caused by ventricular arrhythmias. So the, they, that is how they present. They present with syncope and then they die. And even at a, a countries with the best healthcare services, out of hospital cardiac arrest, the, the chance of for you to survive an out of hospital cardiac arrest is at best is ten percent. So, uh, so this is an important point that you need to remember, syncope has to be taken very seriously. So apart from being dead or seriously injured, syncope can have a significant impact to a person's life. So physical trauma, a disruption of school, and we get a lot of school children, either they are you know, unhappy to go to school or the parents are uh, 
children to school and teachers they are not happy to have uh, children who develop syncope in in their premises so significant uh, uh, disruption to schooling and workplace disruption and if some uh, people might develop syncope while they drive so as a whole it has a, a significant you know personal and uh, impact and that can be you know, extended to the you know, family or into the surrounding environment or the society and as a whole uh, it could have significant economical impact as well so if you take any syncope patient hundred of them come to you know uh, to treatment or seek attention uh, medical attention to an emergency department and if you observe them for 30 days 11 people can either die or experience serious uh, outcome uh, due to syncope. So this is a very big number, 11 out of 100. So at least one person can die uh, within 30 days. Uh, six point, roughly around 7% might experience in a non-fatal CV outcome while they are staying at the emergency department. Another roughly 4% or 4 out of four out of 100 people might experience uh, other uh, major uh, cardiovascular events, including strokes uh, in 30 days to come. So this is an important, very high number. So this is, that is why we have to take, when a person comes with syncope, that means there's something very, very wrong in their body that might, we might have to find them out. So how common the syncope is, you can see there's a bimodal distribution. Syncope is highest when a, in a patients, young, in younger patients. This is mostly due to the vasovagal syncope. And it started to gradually fall down. And uh, the, the least stage of, for to experience a syncope is around 50. And if you develop a syncope in that age, it's mostly going to be you know, very pathological due to a cardiac causes. And you can see gradually as we go older, the, the rates of syncope goes up. This is due to you know, uh, age-related factors uh, causing mostly uh, orthostatic hypertension and cardiovascular uh, disease-related syncope. So uh, this is important that uh, I can see that uh, at more than 100 people have joined this uh, lecture so far. And uh, so out of that 100, 50 would at least experience a one episode of syncope in your lifetime. <laughs> so it's important. So this dilemma, this debate has always been going on, syncope versus epileptic fit, how to differentiate. There can be various you know, factors from your history, the, the person who observed uh, the account from the eyewitness, the, the triggers that was preceded the event, or um, you know, characteristic of the you know, fall or the rigidity, so various things, but uh, none of them are either 100% sensitive or specific. So what the most important that I need to give to you all is that having a fit does not rule out syncope. Same way, not having a fit does not rule out epilepsy as well. So you have to think deep and think laterally as well. So it is important that I advise my uh, team and our colleagues to not to use either syncope or fit, uh, because sometimes proving that event is a syncope or a fit or epilepsy is can be quite hard. So in order to keep the mind open, I normally ask them to write transient loss of consciousness. That is the umbrella term in which you can either have syncope or epilepsy or other psychogenic causes as well. So next time, remember to keep that open mind, uh, not having a fit or having a fit does not rule out anything. So there can be many causes that might get confused with syncope, you know, generalized seizures, uh, partial seizures, abs absence seizures, so pseudo syncopies, and there can be situations where a person can fall without a transient loss of consciousness, sleep disorders like cataplexy, intracranial hemorrhages, vertebral bacillus TIAs, carotid TIAs, subclavian steel syndrome. And uh, 
metabolic disorders like you know hypoglycemia hypoxia hyperventilation uh, hypocapnia medic intoxication and cardiac arrest even other conditions due to causing coma so there can be various conditions that might uh, come across in your practice that might look like a syncope so moving from that we will now uh, talk about how to you know evaluate these patients and in keep in mind and uh, restratifying these patients so we have to answer very important questions if a patient comes to with loss of consciousness so first thing what you need to determine is it a t lock and if it is a t lock is it a syncope and is it a syncope is there a clear etiological diagnosis and the fourthly you have to look for features that indicates that patient is having high cardio risk of cardiovascular events or death so uh, taking a detailed history i know it's quite challenging in our you know congested setup uh, uh, to take a detailed history but when it's come to syncope detailed history will give you the best chance of you know identifying the etiology and identifying exactly what happened that patient and is whether there are any risk factors so history taking is important about the, the present event the previous attacks and if you are lucky the eyewitness account and take a detailed history about the past medical events you know including ischemic heart disease coronary artery disease uh, strokes Uh, history of epilepsy fit uh, evidence of previous transient loss of consciousness and uh, even you know uh, drowning uh, if there history of road traffic accident because have a patient might develop a syncope while driving and ended up having a road traffic accident patient might develop syncope while swimming ended up having uh, drowning suffered drowning and then so those things these are so indirect clues of a patient having some sort of an uh, issue going on so it's important to go back to these details as well the family history of sudden cardiac death the premature death or there can be people you know have you know those who have been a, you know a very careful driver has suffer you know sustain and a road traffic encounter road traffic accident that might point to a cardiac issue going on even drowning or even fits then you need to folk do a thorough physical examination uh, that includes you know measuring blood pressure both in supine and standard standing positions so ecg is basic and some of these patient require specialist evaluation so there can be basically three main causes causing syncope the the majority of these things are orthostatic that is where the body fails to maintain the uh, blood pressure in upright position and reflex syncope causes uh, uh, half of the rest of the syncopes whereas cardiac syncope though the the number are less the effect is too much so it is always make sure that you rule out a cardiac syncope in a patient who present with transient loss of consciousness so reflex syncope is a, we will discuss about it in a, in a little bit later the reflex syncope is an, a mystery disease no one knows exactly why it is there it is uh, the technical correct technical term is called neurocardio inhibitory reflex syncope it is something to do with the brain and in certain scenarios uh, in circumstances which we call you know triggers it causes the brain to react in an unusual way causing blood pressure and the heart rate to drop causing patient to lose consciousness why it happens it can happen due to various reasons the commonest is the orthostatic that means an in upright position or seated or standing position where the brain get underperfused and the brain will initiate as a reflex in mechanism to uh, causing the patient to have a loss of consciousness and fall so some people this reflex mechanism can be activated due to emotional triggers you know sudden fear uh anger kind of scenarios and there can be situational syncopes you know especially irritation from the gi tracts or genital urinary tract and rarely cough induced uh, syncopes as well 
some can experience post exceptional syncopies where can be various other triggers noxious triggers uh, in our in sing our culture the people are talking about nila nila is actually the uh, is where uh, uh, people can develop uh, the brain can initiate a reflex syncope mechanism due to the stimulation of with certain areas you know like elbow knee joint there are particular areas where uh, if you you know put pressure on those areas the they are the brain is specifically wired in a way that it initiates a vasovagal response uh, causing severe bradycardia and heart rate to drop the same thing happened during anesthesia as well spinal and uh, you know intubation because of the irritation of the throat and and you know uh, putting a cut uh, from a sharp uh, uh, scalpel without giving adequate amount of local anesthesia Uh, that is the dox uh, pain induced syncope the brain can initiate a vas or a severe vasovagal response so orthostatic hypertensions we discuss about this most of the time our patient uh, suffer this because of the the medication we put them on you know beta blockers calcium channel blockers prescine and uh, all kinds of diuretics especially ace inhibitors and these medication causes Uh, you know uh, cut down in the in uh, the peripheral you know vascular tone causing drop in total peripheral resistance and patient will experience orthostatic hypertension especially this condition is common in elderly people you know the mechanism that are in place to make sure the blood pressure is maintained in upright position is either slowed or diseased so elderly people they tend to experience orthostatic hypertension uh, quite often volume depletion is important thing we don't drink enough water and patients are on you know diuretics that they push the water out not only diuretics remember the the newer medications like sodium glucose transport inhibitor emphagliflozin dafagliflozin these medication push the water out from the body and uh, so that causes orthostatic hypertension really in a primary autonomic conditions in advanced uh, new, uh, neurodegenerative diseases like parkinsons and uh, and and secondary autonomic failures can be seen in advanced diabetic ckd patients so this condition can give rise to orthostatic hypertension the cardiac uh, causes for syncope are mainly arrhythmias either bradyarrhythmias or tachyarrhythmias the structural cardiac disease like you know obstructive cardiac lesions like mitral stenosis uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy aortic stenosis uh, palmar palmar stenosis and great vessels like you know pulmonary embolism so remember one of the ways of pulmonary embolism to present is syncope so if you take a detailed history there can be certain clues from the history that will so not remember none of these things are either 100% sensitive or specific but it might tell you something uh, you know help you out in order to figure out what the diagnosis if a syncope happen in supine position it could be due to arrhythmia or patient can develop a syncope due to psychological reason even vasovagal syncope is possible if it is due to a pain or fear during sleep normally either it is epilepsy or arrhythmias remember that and uh, in sitting position all three are possible uh, you know orthostatic vasovagal syncope orthostatic hypertension or even any arrhythmia can occur at any time standing for some time most of the time it is orthostatic hypertension or orthostatic uh, vasovagal syncope and if a patient develop a syncope you know loss of consciousness unsteadiness giddiness couple of steps after standing and straightening from bending or squatting position most of the time it is due to orthostatic hypertension the mixuration defecation remember uh, uh, vasovagal cough normally vasovagal swallowing is vasovagal if patient develops syncope during swallowing so it's vasovagal means it's a reflex syncope and during and after meal all three are possible remember uh, in brugada patients uh, uh, arrhythmia can happen after a meal and head movements or pressure on the neck that is a carotid sinus syndrome Uh, and fear pain instrumentation normally vasovagal it remember even arrhythmia can happen during physical exertion so it's important to find out exactly what was the patient doing 
if a patient is doing something actively that is where the sympathetic nervous system is in play so normally vasovagal syncope does not happen in the presence of a sympathetic activation because it is completely opposite so it's important to determine to ask the question do you did you develop syncope during sport activity or after finishing it because it's important in the recovery period it is normally the vasovagal syncope that happens due to vagal activation whereas when a person is doing something actively you know like playing or running it is normally uh, the sympathetic activity that is in place or, and thereby it makes it mostly cardiac in nature rather than vasovagal and recovery period after excision is generally vasovagal uh, remember uh, arrhythmias can happen uh, uh, in uh, um, especially in brugada patients so having palpitation it could be due to arrhythmia or it could be due to vasovagal we might remember that in vasovagal uh, uh, activation uh, the body undergoes several phases where the before the heart rate drops and the blood pressure drops the initially due to the under perfusion of the brain the brain initially try to improve the perfusion by raising the heart rate so the patient will experience palpitation initially before vasovagal attacks sets in so patient might remember that page he or she had experienced palpitation before the syncope so having palpitation does not rule out vasovagal syncope still arith arrhythmia is high on the card but remember even uh, there's condition called post uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia where uh, people develop un uh, unnecessary higher heart rates in upright position and the patient become very symptomatic due to palpitation so strong emotions vasovagal is possible and even cardiac because it is strong emotion leads to change in the hormonal environmental suddenly and that can you know kick off an arrhythmia startling normally long qt syndrome you know like sudden noise uh, sudden emotion can uh, initiate arrhythmias in congenital long qt syndrome during febrile illness uh, normally due to dehydration patient are more prone to develop vasovagal syncope however remember brugada patient can develop arrhythmias during febrile illness sleep deprivation causes vasovagal syncope that is where people get confused you know sleep deprivation causes epilepsy epileptic fits as well so remember uh, sometime vasovagal syncope can be quite dramatic quite frightening and people might get it confused with some epilepsy and heat weather heat uh, hot environment hot bath normally vasovagal syncope or orthostatic hypertension because after hot bath it leads to peripheral vasodilatation and uh, and the effective volume might drop and the patient will experience orthostatic hypertension or vasovagal syncope if you are lucky enough to have a witness normally our people aren't that much you know trained to observe this thing normally they go into panic mode and in and you may have seen that how people our people attend to patients who fall onto the ground so they might not be able to give this much of a detailed history but if someone is you know uh, calm enough or intelligent enough to pick, pick this things up sometimes these clues can be helpful so normally uh, if a person fall kneeling over stiff it normally is due to syncope the flaccid collapse is generally due to syncope but atonic epilepsy can give rise to syncope the movement before fall it's if due to epilepsy the movements after fall either can be syncope or epilepsy movement with the loss of consciousness generally it is due to uh, epilepsy the movements are countless normally it is due to syncope but generally even syncope that is called reflex anoxic seizure where a patient develop asystole and the brain does not get enough blood so the brain will start to fit that's what i mentioned having a fit does not or never whatsoever rule out the possibility of a syncope whereas not having a syncope not having a fit in a loss of consciousness episode you remember that uh, really atonic epilepsy is absence seizures 
they may not have you know the so called characteristic shaky movement but still it still it can be a epilepsy so keep the open mind so all form of syncope are more likely to occur or it can happen with a severe uh, degree when a patient is on vasoactive medications you know like the medication that causes blood pressures to drop or the heart rate to drop or if a patient is under the influence of alcohol and when there is a possibility of volume depletion and when a patient is having you know uncontrolled bronchial asthma or a copd like pulmon or pulmonary embolism and environmental fa factors such as you know humid environment or even anemia so these things also need to remember when you are treating your patients so active standing is something you can do at a clinic level where we put the pa patient on a uh, initially on a supine patient position and take a blood pressure and heart rate measurement and then we ask the patient to stay up on their feet for 3 minutes and take a blood pressure measurement so abnormal blood pressure response is determined by three things one thing if there is a drop in systolic blood pressure more than 20 or sustained drop in diastolic blood pressure more than 10 or uh, if the blood pressure remain low below 90 those three scenarios are considered as abnormal blood pressure response and if the patient mounted in a, a more than 30 beats rise in heart rate or heart rate goes beyond 120 that is also considered as an abnormal heart rate response so uh, ecg is an important thing that uh, you would do for any patient who come to you with the transient loss of consciousness remember many patient can have an ecg abnormality that are transient especially arrhythmias and by the time the patient come to you and the ecg can be normal so having a normal ecg does not rule out a possibility of a cardiac cause this is an important thing to remember and it is always important when your patient come to you with an ecg to verify what was the symptom when the patient was having by the time ecg was taken so this is called symptom ecg correlation so most of the time these patients may have subtle clues on their ecgs that can be easily overlooked or can be missed for an untrained person or if you are going through the ecg without an anticipation so so i'm not talking about you know missing a, a complete heart block or a significant sinus bradycardia that is not the case but there can be certain ecg clues a person may for an untrained person has a chance to miss so so remember next time when you look at an ecg look for those things so biphasicular block interventricular conduction abnormalities you know morbid type 1 secondary av block or first degree av block asymptomatic mild inappropriate bradycardia and heart rate having of around 40 to 50 it's not unusual for a person to suffer a syncope or even epilepsy can have you know relatively slow heart rate if they present quite early enough and if you see you know non sustained vts you know couplet triplets and pre excitation can be quite you know deceiving sometimes uh, for untrained person uh, uh, and it can be so easily missed <clears throat> long and short qt intervals <clears throat> unless you take an effort to measure the qt interval there's a chance that you might miss it early repolarization that means with st elevations uh, and uh, and um, and uh, in various lead and brugada pattern and uh, you know abnormal t wave inversion remember avr and v1 can have uh, normal t wave inversions and young children less than 60 years of age t wave can be inverted up to v3 even in women so there can be normal variations as well and uh, evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy i'll now you present some ecg so you to recognize now this ecg if you can see the patient is in sinus rhythm pr interval is normal 
the frontal plane axis is deviated to the left. So left axis deviation is there. And you can see the V1 is showing RSR pattern, uh, rabbit ear. Uh, so small r uh, is and a big r. So this patient has evidence of, uh, so left axis deviation means the patient is having left anterior hemifascicular block. So you know that left bundle branch has two fascicles. Uh, or some people argue that there can be three as well, but for your purposes, two fascicles, left anterior hemifascicle and left posterior hemifascicle. So in this patient, so left anterior hemifascicle is this defunct. So the left axis division has happened and there is evidence of right bundle branch block. So, however, the PR interval is normal. The PR interval is determines from uh, the onset of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. That is the time taken from sinus node activation to the atrial depolarization to reach the ventricular depolarization. So that include in, uh, impulses traveling from atrias to the sin is AV node and from AV node to the bundle of his and to the, the bundle branches and up to the ventricles. The PR interval is normal. That means the conduction is okay. So it tells you indirectly that the AV node is also okay. However, the infranodal conduction tissue is diseased in this patient. Right bundle is diseased and the left bundle also started to become diseased. So uh, the, the, the so-called trifascicular block is a misnomer. There's nothing called trifascicular block. If technically speaking, trifascicular block means complete AV block because the right, left anterior hemifascicle is blocked, the left posterior hemifascicle is blocked, the right bundle branch blocked. So there should not be any conduction from AV node to the bottom. So it should give rise to a complete AV block. So this is a bifascicular block. These things sometimes can be missed easily. So you, there are, you know, I put this ECG, you can see the various type of hard blocks. First degree hard blocks, occasionally the one P wave is dropping and uh, then uh, you can see here that uh, uh, second degree view, every other beat is blocked. Uh, and uh, you, the, this one, you can see that the PR interval is gradually becoming prolonged and then it is dropped. So it's called Wenke back. And this is where, you know, uh, occasionally beat is dropped. Uh, so it's a type two uh, second degree view block. This is where two to one block has happened. And in here you can see clearly there's the P waves and QRS complex has no association. They are going separately on their own, causing uh, complete AV block. So this is where the, you can see that premature ventricular complexes. The correct term is premature ventricular complexes. It was previously called premature ventricular contraction. No longer we call it. We call it premature ventricular complexes. You can see one, two, three, four here. It's a quadruplet. So more than three is by definition is called non-sustained VT. Sustained VT is where arrhythmia VT is lasting more than 30 seconds. So this is a non-sustained VT one way. So this itself should not be causing the syncope, but so this is this gives a clue that there's something happening in this patient and could have been the reason for the patient's presentation. So this is, you can see uh, sinus bradycardia. The heart rate is around 40. So mild sinus bradycardia. Uh, this is not sure whether you can see carefully. Uh, there is a P wave and the P wave is basically merged with the QRS complexes. So this patient is having pre-excitation. So this is a manifested pre-excitation on sinus rhythm. Therefore, it is called WPW syndrome. So these things can be quite easily overlooked or missed if you do not look at them carefully. So this is a condition where you can appreciate that, you know, partial RBB with the covert type of ST elevation in V1, V2. So this is classical spontaneous type 1 Brugada pattern. So when the patient does not have symptoms, it is called Brugada pattern. Remember, Brugada pattern can be dynamic and it can, it can appear and disappear. So if you have slightest suspicions, one thing you can do is to 
redo the ecg ask in the ecg technician to apply the lead the v1 v2 we normally apply at the fourth intercostal space instead ask them to apply at the second intercostal space because in brugada syndrome the sodium channelopathy occurs mostly in the right ventricular outflow tract area so it is not a diffuse disease so the changes are more if you do a ecg or if you apply the electrodes that capture right ventricular outflow tract electrical activity more so that is why just starts to push the v1 v2 v2 to intercostal space above that will give you better yield so that's an important clue that you can practice this patient has you know uh, significant t wave abnormalities so diffuse t wave inversion and if you carefully measure the qt interval qt interval is prolonged so it's a uh, uh, long qt this is uh, can, uh, this is you can see that occasionally a, a beat is missing this is not heart block this is called is a part of six sinus syndrome if you measure carefully uh, the missing p is there and there is no qrs complex as well so the, this is where the sinus node was unable to depolarize so this is called sinoatrial exit block and this is uh, a part of six sinus syndrome this is this is you can you can carefully see here uh, short qt if you, you need to measure this interval um, can, i'm not sure you can whether you can appreciate there's after st elevation on lead 2 or 3 so uh, the one of the main important differential diagnosis for st elevation is st elevation mi but there can be various other reasons for a person to have st elevation this is called early repolarization and patients with early repolarization might develop ventricular arrhythmias so if your patient requires further assessment so one of the important thing is the ambulatory rhythm monitoring which we call halter and all, all these patients should have a cardiac structural imaging that at least it should include an echocardiogram and patient who are suspected to have a reflex syncope they need to have carotid sinus massage especially when they are above age of 40 and some patient will end up needing a tilt table test and rarely patient will need invasive electrophysiological testing and no, don't forget to do the blood test you know do the full blood count tsh electrolyte and do the oxygen saturation and depending on the scenario d dimers remember pulmonary embolism can present with syncope and even coronary event can present with syncope so troponin and d dimers are important so you have to, you know, uh, tailor mate as to exactly what you are going to do in terms of heart rhythm monitoring. So remember, these patients they have symptoms in paroxysmal. So if you, uh, if you, if your patient is having a syncope every once in a month, so doing a 24-hour ECG may not ex exclude anything. So that turns out to be normal, but still patient have something wrong in their body. So you have to plan uh, your investigations according to the frequency of the symptom unfortunately in this country due, due to you know a lot of reasons the extended whole search event counter they are not available so so that is where we have that. and is this implantable loop recorders they are so expensive but remember some of your patient may be having apple phones now some of these apple phones are quite equipped or capable of you know taking uh, heart rate and taking even single lead ecgs so you can utilize your technology available to monitor these patients. So smartphone-based heart rhythm monitoring has become a very popular thing in the Western world. So if a patient is suspected of cardiac syncope, you will. So some patient will need exercise testing because dependent. Suppose a patient develops syncope uh, during exercise, so we can simulate the same scenario by doing an exercise testing. Only rarely that some patient will require invasive EP study where we put catheters into the heart, we check the electrical wiring of the heart, and we take measurements. The uh, structural echo, uh, uh, assessment should include an echo, and depending on the scenario, coronary angiogram or a CT coronary angiogram or cardiac MRI. 
So orthostatic saline is something we do for our patient. Now, in your physiology days, you remember that when a person uh, who stay flat on the bed, go up on their toes, it causes orthostatic challenge. So what happens is it leads to displacement of the blood from the thorax into the lower limbs and the abdominal cavity because of the gravity. Now, even though the heart pumps act actively, the pumps blood actively, the two-third which goes, the body or two-third of the body is just lying underneath the heart. So even if the heart pumps acti pump, pump blood actively, because of the gravity, it goes so easily down. But uh, if your legs aren't moving, the lower limb muscles aren't moving, there is hardly a sufficient mechanism to push the blood back up. So it causes venous pooling, especially if you are sta stay still or, or seated for a longer period, the venous pooling happen in a uh, massive way that the, the, the venous return will be reduced. So unless there is a you know, compensatory mechanism, the brain will eventually uh, experience low blood pressure and the patient will develop a syncope. So there are so much of mechanisms that are in place, physiological mechanisms that are in place in the body to not, not to allow this to happen. So this is the exact thing what we are testing. So this is called tilt table testing. So we put the patient flat on a bed and they stay, leave the patient like that for a few, 10, several minutes. And then we put the patient on a tilt position, 70 degree, and we continuously monitor the blood pressure. So we leave the patient at least 20 to 40 minutes on the tilt table uh, in upright position. You can see the patient is tied up to the bed. So the patient cannot move his or her legs. So we are checking the uh, blood pressure, the heart rate, and the ECG, and sometimes even EEG. So tilt table test is used as a you know both uh, diagnostic test as well as a therapeutic test as well. So these conditions, reflex syncope, orthostatic hypertension, even POTS or even pseudo syncope, we use the tilt table test to rule in or rule out. And it can also be used to you know. Some of these patients, especially reflex syncope, they experience a group of symptoms due to vagal activation before uh, it progressed into a true syncope. That is called prodrome. You, some of you may have experienced this thing you know, in upright position. Uh, you feel dizzy, you feel giddy, the palpitation, sweating, the nauseated feeling, uh, unable, you know, feeling unwell, unable to keep the head up, you know, yawning. Uh, so all kinds of feeling that is called prodrome. So one of the important things uh, when it comes to treating reflex syncope is to you know I uh, educate the patient to identify these prodromal symptoms and act before it progress into a full blown syncope. So that, that can be taught to the patient by doing the tilt table test. So we can guide the patient to recognize the symptoms. And, and then the patient can uh, him or herself and identify when, when these symptoms appear. So what happens in uh, if you go through your patient, most of the time when the patient start having these symptoms, most of the time they try to either go up and you know, try to walk and try to go to the bed. So that is where people fall. So it is important that your patient recognize these symptoms early so the patient can take measurements to prevent it for uh, progress into a full-blown syncope or to minimize injury as a result of the fall. So I'm not going to de uh, go into the detail as to how we do these tests. So we normally ask the patient to come fasting and we put the patient on the bed and uh, stay like that. Sometimes we give GTN to, you know, uh, to do the vasodilatation so it will... Uh, enhance the augment the tilt response and then we put the patient on a tilt position 60 to 70 degree and then we'll keep on uh, monitoring the patient so most of the time these patient will develop symptoms when while we do the tilt table test so tilt response is where with the patient started to experience the symptoms the prodrome and then patient will develop the syncope and normally there'll be a 
symptoms ecg or symptom signs correlation the patient will develop bradycardia and the drop in blood pressure and when normally the systolic blood pressure go below 90 degree the patient will start to feel dizzy and when the systolic blood pressure drops below 60 patient will lose their consciousness so this is what exact happened so initially the blood pressure the, the patient is put on the tail that time counter is on the uh, the normally when you put the patient up on the tilt position the blood pressure started to slowly go down and normally it is being compensated by rising the heart rate and if the patient develop orthostatic vasovagal syncope the heart rate will start to drop the blood pressure will start to drop and when it drops below a very critical value the patient will start to feel symptoms so uh, remember that uh, tilt table test positivity is neither 100% sensitive nor specific even if patient if you can see this here the uh, highlighted in red color even patient with cardiac syncope if you put them on the tilt table test there's a chance that it might become positive either as high as 50% of the time so the reason is suppose a patient who has complete heart block that they have bradycardia if you put them uh, on an upright position the, uh, the the body cannot you know increase the heart rate to maintain the maintain the brain perfusion so the brain will start to experience under perfusion and the patient brain will initiate a vasovagal response so remember the vasovagal response can occur even in bradycardia uh, cardiac syncope as well cardiac causes so carotid sinus massage is something we do you know the carotid sinus is vaguely innovated uh, uh, it is at the uh, bifurcation of the common country artery and uh, so if you press that area it causes activation of the uh, vagal uh, vagal system and uh, causing bradycardia so patients who especially this carotid sinus syndrome is where uh, the carotid sinus is either overactive or overly sensitive to minimal pressure and causing massive vagal inflow uh, outflow to the heart causing bradycardia or blood pressure drop and leading to syncope this is common in especially elderly people that is where we uh, normally carotid sinus massage is offered for patients who are more than 40 years of age so autonomic function sometimes needed to measure especially in orthostatic hypertension so there are various testing we do uh, uh, it's normally not us that is been doing. This is normally the physiologists, physiologists that people, you know, uh, the people who are at the physiology departments. They uh, they are the one who normally do this kind of you know various calculations are required to assess the autonomic nervous function. So let uh, let let us talk about a few things about reflex syncope. Reflex syncope is a mis uh, mystery. Honestly, we don't know why exactly why it is there. The what's the purpose of it? The the current theory is is actually a maladaptation of our evolution. You know, we freed our hands and unlike other animals, we stay up on our feet. So always, his brain is under constant threat to uh, under perfusion, and the brain has develop on on mechanism so reflex syncope is actually a brain way of telling go down so it is actually the brain who makes the fall so brain thinks that uh, you know put the patient flat on the uh, floor uh, to ensure the brain perfusion and that, so brain how does the brain do that brain does it by you know um, enhancing the vagal response, causing heart rate and blood pressure to drop. So there are various other scenarios where the brain does the same thing. So these higher centers uh, uh, for dilatation. So normally there can be input from the higher centers like you know fear, pain, fear emotions can trigger the same response uh, we mentioned about this you know uh, stimuli from in, from the gi tract the geo tract the respiratory system can initiate the same response so reflex syncope normally it sets off by uh, uh, hemodynamic instability and, and 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 as i mentioned earlier the gi symptoms 
or other painful triggers can initiate the same response. So orthostatic hypertension, we discuss about the same thing. Is that functional impairment of the autonomic nervous system, uh, structural or the functional impairment of the autonomic system, uh, causing unable to maintain blood pressure in upright position. So there are three types of uh, orthostatic hypertension, early orthostatic, classic orthostatic, or delayed orthostatic. When the blood pressure drops under a one minute, it causes early orthostatic hypertension. Classic hypertension is where normally patients uh, started to drop the blood pressure in, in the third minute. So this is the classic one. That is why we, when we do the you know, active standing, we ask the patient to stay up for, for three minutes before we take the measurement. And there can be a delayed variety as well. This is very much the tea table test. As we observe the patient for more than 20 minutes, so some patients started to drop their blood pressure uh, very late and uh, causing uh, syncope. So management wise, if you take this patient uh, at uh, you know come across this encounter this patient in emergency department, you have to answer three main questions. Is there a serious underlying cause that can be identified? What is the risk of serious outcome? And should this patient be admitted? So we you know that many patients come to with syncope and not all of them require admission at the same time. But all of them requires investigations, but it does not necessarily mean that the patient should be ad ad admitted. So there are a few high risk features one has to pay attention when you, uh, you know, evaluate a patient who comes with syncope. The patient is having new onset of chest, this chest pain, shortness of breath, headache or abdominal pain, you admit them. If the syncope happened during exercise or in supine function, you should admit them. If the syncope comes along with sudden onset palpitation, yes. And if the syncope happens out of nowhere without having a prodrome, or this can be due to two things. One thing is actually the patient did not have a prodrome. Suppose an arrhythmia happens like a VT, it happens out of nowhere and the patient collapses immediately. Same way, especially in elderly people, because of the event, they, will, they can have retrograde amnesia. The patient may not recall the events before the true syncope. So they will also come and say to you, I suddenly collapse. So even that happens, the patient should be admitted. And especially when there is a family history of sudden cardiac death or premature death, cardiovascular death, they should be also admitted. From the past medical history, people who has a long history of recurrent syncope from their childhood happening in hot weather environment at school, standing at assembly and, and, and having you know, uh, uh, absence of a cardiac history, young healthy patients, they are generally low risk patient, you can discharge them. But when a patient is having a coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease, structural heart disease or a history of arrhythmia, you should not be discharging them. Discharging them, they should be admitted. And in your physical examination, if the patient is having low blood pressure, systolic blood pressure less than 90, or evidence of GI bleed or persistent bradycardia less than 40, or patient is having a murmur, they should also be admitted. Okay. So how to treat these patients? So based on etiology. So if you know, a reflex syncope is a benign condition, but it can have various consequences. So reflex syncope, if the patient education is the most important thing. So patient need to be at, uh, educated about the diagnosis and identifying the prodrome and identifying the triggers the patient can be your friend because it's especially when the patients are well educated, they should also be included in the part of our management because they can do a lot for themselves. So they should be educated about the risk. Runs. What I normally uh, do is I advise them, you know, about you know recognizing uh, these uh, prodromal symptoms and do the lifestyle modification and do the behavioral environment changes. Because the reflex syncope is not something we cannot cure. It is something, you know, hardwired to the body. So only the best thing that we can do is actually 
preventing the triggers from triggering it off and preventing the, the vulnerable environment. So I advise them about avoiding sleep deprivation, prolonged physical exertion, dehydration, and, and also advise that what circumstances which can happen, the syncope can happen so easily. Febrile uh, scenarios, you know, febrile illness, the patient normally get dehydrated, they don't take enough water. So, uh, so this is where the syn reflex syncope can happen so easily. And if the patient is, you know, stand, uh, standing or seated for a prolonged period. So there are little, little things the patient can do to, you know, prevent the, prevent it from triggering off. And it's important that uh, patient should be advised about uh, take adequate enough of, uh, amount of fluids and normally it is good to cut down uh, salt intake for you know controlling hypertension but when it's come to reflexing copy we normally ask the patient to take sufficient amount of salt because the salt is the one holding the water inside the body so it's important uh, to advise them to take enough salt as well especially the patients having significant symptoms and depending on what we find on the you know trigger or the or the tilt table test, we will treat them accordingly. Some patient would require you know, fructocortis or midodrine is alpha blocker, and there can be uh, patients are, patient can be advised about the counter pressure maneuvers, calf muscle strengthening exercises, and very occasionally some patient will require a pacemaker implantation as well. And to make the matter more complicated, some of these patients who has reflex syncope actually having hypertension as well. So they have hypertension in one end and they have hypertension in the uh, reflex hypertension in the other end. So making the management quite complex. So suppose a patient with hypertension coming to you with the reflex syncope and having noted to have low blood pressure, that does not tell you that the medication was causing this thing. So it is the autonomic nervous system. Most of the time, this essential nervous, uh, essential hypertension is something to do with the, you know, dysregulation of the autonomic system. So they can have both. They can have hypertension one end and they can have hypotension on the other end as well. So patient to those who are on hypertension treatment, what I normally advise is to, you know, try to avoid them on diuretics and try to avoid them on HCTs. And I normally, if they can afford, you know, like presocid medication, they have so short-acting medication. I try to put them on long-acting medication, yeah. you know, sustained release or modified relief medication, if they can afford. And they should take adequate amount of water and try to maintain the systolic blood pressure around 140 on these patients. And so very occasionally, this patient requires pacemakers. So you can see that uh, these are some of the uh, things that one patient can be ad advised about. You know, these are called counter pressure maneuvers. This is normally uh, when a patient develops uh, prodrome, uh, this, you know, leg crossing, uh, you know, hand fisting and hand stretch. You know, these are called counter pressure maneuvers. So, this condition will improve the brain perfusion by uh, you know, increasing the blood pressure temporarily and thereby mitigating the initiation of the vasovagal response. So some patient with you know, carotid sinus syndrome will need pacemakers and uh, depending on the severity and depending on how, 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 how prolonged their bradycardia, so how prolonged their asystole is. So there are no novel method of treating reflex syncope. There is a place for catheter ablation that is called cardioneuroablation. That is where we ablate the vagal in, inputs to the heart uh, by putting catheters inside, so cutting off the vagal stimulation to the heart. So thereby avoiding the bradycardias. So orthostatic hypertension, same way like you treat for reflex syncope. So patient education is very important and about lifestyle modifications patients should take adequate hydration one of the important reason in this country the people do not take enough water uh, and you have to be careful about salt intake you have to choose patients correctly 
correctly as to whom should we advise about increasing whole salt intake. Patients who are on, you know, having hypertension, we should not be advised them to increase their salt intake. But other people, especially young people, uh, they should be advised. You know, you know, what happens is the father or mother is having hypertension, so they cut down salt for the whole family and ended up young children not getting enough salt, so thereby making them more vulnerable to develop uh, syncope. So discontinuation of reduction of hypertensive therapy, you have to you know, carefully modify the treatment. The patient should be advised on the counterpressure maneuvers, and some people require you know, graduated compression stockings. I don't think we have abdominal binders. And it is important that you advise the patient to sleep in uh, tilt sleeping. So what I normally ask them to, you know, ask them to you know, put some fellows under the, the head side of the mattress and keeping it lift, uh, you know, uh, inclined. And that gives you uh, the ability to sleep in head up tilt position. So what happened if you lie flat on the bed, the venous return improves and it causes the atria to stretch. So it will lead to secretion of ANP, atrionatriotic peptide. So that causes for you to you know lose salt from the body. Now, if you put uh, if you put the head in an up tilt up position slightly, the venous return is reduced. Atria is not going to get that stretched out. The ANP secretion will be minimal. So it will cause the sodium conservation. So that will also some patients, especially elderly people, you may you may notice that they wake up several times in the night to go to the washroom. So that makes them more vulnerable to develop syncope. So it's important that you advise them to, you know, take adequate water in the daytime and cut down the water intake in the afternoon and ask them to take an early dinner and go to the bed after voiding. And elderly people, especially male, they have prosthetic symptoms, so they tend to have nocturia in the night. So treating or avoiding a fall Sometimes you may have to think very laterally and, you know, get their prostate tissue sorted out, preventing them waking up in the middle of the night to go to the washroom. Uh, so these are little, little things that you can do uh, for your patients. So cardiac syncope, it depends on the etiology. Now, if you have an SVT, you either treat with medication. Remember, SVT, the first line treatment is catheter ablation. Uh, we should not be putting them, these patients on, you know, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers forever they are in life. But most of the time, the catheter ablation is quite effective. 90% of the time, you can create the arrhythmia completely. And when it's come to VT, yeah, uh, catheter ablation is uh, not so available in our setup for VTs. However, the patient uh, normally ended up needing a ICD or antiarrhythmic medications. And brady patients, obviously, if you have an ECG documented bradycardia, six sinus syndrome, symptomatic, you would end up giving them a pacemaker. And definitely all kinds of AV not, especially second and uh, third degree AV block patient should have a pacemaker in. And uh, bifascicular block patients, those who are having evidence of conduction tissue diseases, sometimes they develop you know, intermittent AV block and causing syncope. And if you can prove that, they will normally require pacemaker. So winding up our presentation for today, so there are a few messages that I need to highlight. So syncope is a common symptoms and potentially lethal condition uh, that one has to be uh, very much aware about. And uh, the elaborative history taking is very, very important uh, in your uh, practice. And uh, um, re uh, these patients require uh, thorough evaluation and always keep in mind the risk of sudden cardiac death. That's an important thing. And syncope, remember, can have more than one etiology in the same patient. So treatment is highly uh, uh, individualized. So poor outcomes related to the severity of the underlying disease rather than the syncope. So having a heart disease is the single most indicator to predict the mortality and morbidity. Uh, young people with reflex syncope, generally they have a, uh, 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 
very uh, good prognosis. Uh, so let me take you back to the the pre uh, the previous ECG that I have presented to you very early on my presentation. So about the four case scenarios that uh, uh, we uh, uh, showed I showed to you. Okay. okay. Now, so this case. Um, so, what do you think? Uh, Recording in progress. Uh, so, this is a 28 year old male. Uh, who present with the brief episode give me a second okay. uh, brief disease spells in all postures and uh, disturb sleep with chest tightness and nocturnal sweating and uh, so he did not have significant uh, family med uh, past medical history or family history has been uh, okay as well. So the spot ECG has always been the sinus tachycardia. So Holter is ordered. So what do you see in here? What is the diagnosis? Uh, anyone? <laughs> so So uh, uh, what is the diagnosis in here? So this patient, if you can see at the you know, initial uh, part, uh, you see that uh, the patient is in sinus rhythm. Uh, the PR interval is normal. Then, uh, and there's a QRS complex. Then there's a P wave. Then the QRS complexes. Then all of a sudden, the QRS complexes disappeared and the P wave is going. So this patient has gone into... Uh, uh, complete AV block and ventricular standstill. So this is a uh, lethal, uh, can be very lethal rhythm. Uh, the patient uh, has no cardiac output that when this happens. And luckily for this patient, this was only a brief episode that he was getting and and uh, and the, then the, the AV node conductions improve. So this patient going into complete AV block and without an escape rhythm. So it causes the diagnosis is ventricular standstill due to complete AV block and absence of an escape mechanism. The second one is about this uh, 22, uh, 32 year old house officer uh, who developed a dropped attack uh, during uh, uh, labor room duty. So he had an ECG done nothing exceptional except having few PVCs. So he was observed in the ICU with the whole tooth. What has happened here? So he was in sinus rhythm and he had a PVC uh, popping in. You can appreciate that the PVC is happening right on top of the T-wave. This is sort of, this is called the so-called R on T phenomena, which is no longer, uh, uh, you know, we, we don't no, no longer say it. So it's called prim, uh, short coupled PVC. The PVC is happening uh, quite close to the depolarization, repolarization of the ventricles, initiating a polymorphic VT. So it goes into polymorphic VT, then it degenerates into ventricular fibrillation. He was quite lucky, and this episode has gone unnoticed. 
and uh, no one has noticed even if the patient was in icu i don't know this happened in the middle of the night i don't know the alarm must have been kept off no one has noticed he was so lucky and this episode was lasting for 3 3 minutes and luckily for him the rhythm got organized uh, the only way we could know that he was he was on the he was hooked for a halter and uh, so there was something horribly wrong in that uh, uh, icu so uh, to miss this and and uh, a patient actually you know recovered from having without having a neurological insult uh and the lucky for him the rhythm got organized and then terminate spontaneously this is only one in a million time happens that the uh, vf is you know uh, resolving on its own so this is an extreme scenario where patient develops a syncope due to a you know transiently uh, lasting ventricular fibrillation the third one is a 17 year old girl Uh, who came with blackouts and uh, and uh, 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 who had been experienced so she had been experiencing recurrent blackouts uh, brief unresponsiveness and rigidity at classroom and in ground so all the investigation had been so the the clear clue is here that the patient is having recurrent blackouts uh, in she this all these episodes happened when she was either standing or seated position so she was put to the tail table test so uh, you can see that uh, the initial heart rate was slow when she was at on the oh, so she was slightly bloody cardiac then the she was put back on the til she was put to the tilt the page brought up uh, you remember that pictures i showed you so you can see that when the patient was put back up what happened the heart rate has gone after the normal physiological response to maintain the blood pressure the blood pressure was maintaining and you can see after 10 minutes so she was basically the maintaining the blood pressure uh, in the upright position with the higher heart rate so compared to 53 then now she was having an heart rate of 84 and then after 13 minutes you can see the heart rate has heart rate has gone up even further and the blood pressure started to drop this is the initiation of the vasovagal reflex syncope can see then that is where normally the people feel palpitation the heart rate has gone up to compensate but the blood pressure keep on dropping and then all of a sudden heart rate has came dropping and it became patient became asystol on the tilt table the patient developed so you can see that the patient the blood pressure has dropped below 90 and the patient started to feel dizzy and then the blood pressure became unrecordable because of the asystole and we had to give atropine so this is what exactly showing okay so you can see the by the time the ecg was taken you know, the patient has gone into complete asystole and occasionally q few you know escape q pvc is coming from the ventricle so she was asystole for some time so this is not cardiac arrest yeah this is due to the vagal activation this is due to the vagal act severe vagal activation causing asystole and then you can see the heart rate has started to resolve but normally we we will not leave the patient like this we tend to give atropine to you know hasten the recovery quite quickly so so this is this patient is having the so this test confirm the diagnosis of orthostatic vasovagal syncope so he was she was having the dramatic form the fourth case is about a 8 year old female who had developed recurrent syncope this is very distinctly during dining so this happens only happens when she was uh, eating something and it was quite dramatic enough that she suffered you know injuries so people have done various investigation egs all kinds of thing ecgs echo everything has been normal and then we hooked a halter and this is what we found so this complete flat line it has happened 20 past 40 past 20 in the afternoon in the night in the night she was having her dinner while seated and she developed this so you can see complete flat line this is asystole so this patient is having 
the diagnosis was following induced vasovagal syncope she was having a very good heart rate all the other time she was having pvcs as well but this has happened only when she was having so uh, eating something so this is called uh, the rare form of swallowing syncope so this patient anyhow uh, and uh, will need the pacemaker put in so so these are the cases that we want to highlight so uh, so uh, so you have to remember that uh, you know syncope is an important uh, presentation that most of the time as i mentioned earlier uh, anyone would, would uh, among you would have a syncope episode during your lifetime so it's a common thing and it's important to you know take a deep history uh, deep and thorough history and and paying attention to the cardiovascular history and the family history of cardiovascular diseases and uh, and syncope there had been lot of researchers showing that uh, patients who have died suddenly apparently had come to the hospital with syncopal episode and haven't got properly evaluated then ended up in tragedy same thing happened two weeks ago one of our minor staff uh, came to the hospital in his 40s uh, came to the hospital with faintish episode and the blood pressure heart rate was checked he was normal he was reassured and sent home uh, didn't take an ecg and the same night he came with cardiac arrest he was having brugada syndrome and he went into ventricular fibrillation and luckily uh, he was living close by to the hospital and brought to the hospital quite quickly and we were able to uh, save his life and he went home with on uh, as he came Uh, on on his feet uh, but without uh, with having an icd put in uh, and osipranolin so uh, syncope how trivial it is we have to take it very seriously uh, and uh, pay uh, enough attention to do the detailed assessment and and get the specialist opinion whenever required and uh, so remember that having a fit does not rule out syncope and having not having a syncope the fit does not uh, rule out epilepsy as well so you need to keep things in mind and uh, prefer your treat your patients carefully in you know, adjusting their medications and doing the investigations properly and uh, uh, and uh, get them uh, send in them to Uh, appropriate uh, specialist evaluation thank you have a nice day thank you so much sir for enhancing and refreshing our knowledge on syncope the lecture was indeed uh, very insightful and a very informative one a special mention to the case scenarios towards then they were eye openers uh, we have got couple of questions from the audience sir uh, so getting on to them straight away Uh, the first question is regarding long QT syndrome, sir. I hope uh, you can hear me, sir. Yeah, I can. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. The first question is: Are there T inversions in all long Q? Are there T inversions in all long QT syndrome ECG? So, is it only a con? Is it only on congenital ones? Um, that's a, thank you for that question. Um. Uh, um... T wave inversion. What we call is uh, repolarization abnormalities. So uh, T wave inversion can happen due to various reasons. So not only congenital con long QTs. Uh, suppose a patient who is having hyperkalemia, and uh, they will have QT prolongation and T inversion. So having T inversion does not necessarily tell you that it is congenital. long qt so all the other uh, uh, acute prolonging conditions can have t wave abnormalities so i hope that i have answered so don't yes. not uh, uh, go by the fact that have not having a t wave inversion rules out anything so t inversions basically the remember the ecg is just an observer so ecg records the electric change in the electrical behavior of the heart Okay, so that change in the electrical behavior of the heart can be due to congenital reasons or acquired reasons. Uh, so all the acquired reasons like ischemia, acute ischemia, chronic ischemia, hypertrophy, electrolyte imbalances, autonomic changes, uh, temperature, all can give rise to TV abnormalities. So be it be congenital or acquired, both can give rise to um, TV abnormalities or TV inversions.
thank you sir very well answered uh, we have got one more question uh, is it possible to have vertigo following cardiac events uh sir uh, tell me again please uh yes sir uh, is it possible to have vertigo following cardiac events absolutely yes oh. so remember vertigo is a symptom it's a neurological symptoms as well as an uh, you know symptoms of the you know inner ear now let me put this example now patient who came with a stroke okay uh care. that stroke can be due to secondary to in syncope now patient who have in their 70s having diabetes hypertension what happened they have atherosclerotic diseases in various severity so that includes the cerebral vessel as well suppose even the blood pressure drop in a gradual fashion depending on the severity of the stenosis the brain can experience ischemia in various degrees okay so even a patient who has suffered a stroke the, that initiation of that stroke could have been due to syncope the same way vertigo okay so if the the brain part that is responsible for the balance is under ischemia the patient will present as vertigo so so remember so these are these can be syncope equivalent so having a vertigo or not having syncope or disease spell so in, in you have to make sure that our uh, what exactly our patients say they say kalante karakilla uh, as kaluankahanoa vatuna so various terms so you have to find out exactly what they mean suppose a patient develop a vertigo episode while lying flat on the bed then turning to a side that is not due to syncope that is definitely it is called positional vertigo so that is more likely due to the inner ear issue okay the same way the patient might develop vertigo when they trying to change their posture from lying flat to supine position it could be due to you know central nervous causes it could be due to the internal causes or it could be due to postural hypertension so so you have to keep that in mind that uh, sometimes so that is why we are we required multi disciplinary approach so ideally the pc patient requires a neurologist assessment a ent specialist assessment as well as a cardiologist assessment so in order to determine exactly what happens so having vertigo does not rule out anything but you need little bit more detail exactly how that vertigo happens and other thing is they may be having primary vertigo episode coming from the central nervous causes and if the vertigo severe enough it might lead to secondary vasovagal activation as well giving rise to bradycardia so i have seen lot of patient coming with vertigo and have bradycardia that is secondary so people might get confused that the bradycardia was causing vertigo is apparently the vertigo was causing bradycardia due to vagal activation so all these possibilities are there so uh, try not to confine or commit yourself to one particular thing keep the things open yes yeah. thank you yeah. yes sir thank you sir very well answered uh, thank you for your clear and precise explanations on behalf of all the participants we would like to thank once again dr kirti bandara divulava consultant cardiac electrophysiologist for his excellent lecture and precious time thank you so much sir uh and thank you thank you for participating and allowing giving me the opportunity to to uh, give this talk uh, and keep up the good work thank you all for participating thank have you. a good day thank you sir. and uh, special thanks to the participants for their participation it's for it was a great pleasure to have more than 120 participants for today's session please follow the link in the chat functions uh, to get your e certificate and we hope to see you all in a similar webinars in future thank you everyone have a good day. thanks